Uh, this week we're going to be talking about the events that happened between Genesis chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 9. Of course, we won't read that all. But I do encourage you to read through it. And as you do read through it, and you see all the funny names and the long lists of genealogies that we'll find throughout the Old Testament, I want you to remember that these are actually an integral part of what Genesis is trying to say. Remember I said it's a family story. And so it's important that each person is accounted for to show the continuation of this family line. But let us read from chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, and then chapter 9, verses 1 to 11. The Lord saw the wickedness of saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out a man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made him. But Noah found faith in the eyes of the Lord. chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and gave and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the field and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from every man. For from, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Now water, as we all as we can and said know very well, is dangerous. This year has seen numerous deaths on the Arkansas River. In areas of flash flooding, water can come in and come in like a wall, destroying everything in its path. Perhaps you will recall images of the earthquake and tsunami from Japan just a few years ago. The water rushed through everything, leaving only desolation in its path, even leading to the partial meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Many scientists are predicting catastrophic sea level increases in the next few generations. Whether or not this comes to pass, it is safe to say that we know. Even in the remote and high mountains of Colorado, the terrible power of water. Many ancient people, especially those who are not, were not normally accustomed to traveling on open seas, had a visceral fear of the seas and the oceans. And so it was with the people who wrote the Old Testament and with their surrounding cultures. When Jonah, for example, is thrown overboard into the sea, he describes his experience as descending into the underworld, or Sheol. It is not surprising, then, that the biblical authors would use the ocean as a symbol and a vehicle for God's judgment. Genesis 1 showed us that before everything was made, there was the ocean over which the Spirit of God hovered. And so it will come to pass that God un 
unmakes its creation, returning it again to the chaotic waters of its beginning. And so it's not surprising that when most people think of Noah and the ark, they think of the family-friendly, zoo-like experience of the animals going up two by two onto the boat. Most art artistic portrayals are of cute giraffes, elephants, and lions climbing up a ramp. It is a terrible thing to think about the destruction of all creation by a terrible deluge, and we don't like to think of our God, the God of Jesus Christ, as one who is capable of killing nearly all life on the face of the earth. And yet, that's what the story of Noah is about. The story of Noah is, a, is the climax, we can call it, of a biblical prehistory. Adam and Eve have two sons in Cain and Abel. And we will recall that Cain kills Abel. That violence ensues shortly after the relationship with God is broken. This is a natural result. If each of us try to become like God and making a good and evil for ourselves, then it is predictable that many will find good cause to kill others who get in their way. Adam and Eve then have a third son, Seth. And from Cain and Seth, our family story continues from generation to generation. Cain's descendants are the creators of civilization. They are musicians, hunters, city and empire builders, and mighty warriors. But they are wicked and estranged from God. These things actually go hand in hand for the author of Genesis. These great men create all sorts of things to achieve a competitive advantage over their rivals. Because they are estranged from God, they do not treat each other or God's creation with the love and care that God does. But they treat people and the creation as resources for personal consumption and progress. Cain's line culminates in the seventh generation with Lamech, who boasts of his fury and vengeance and of his murderous teens. Seth's descendants, on the other hand, walk with God. They seek a right relationship with God, but they are not great inventors or creators. The theme of worldly, unsuccessful, and unmentioned people being God, and the successful being wicked, will continue throughout the rest of the Bible, Old and New Testament. This is what the Song of Mary is about, for example. We see it in the Old Testament, in nations, and in individuals. And so Seth's line culminates, also in the seventh generation, with Enoch, who is taken up into heaven without God. A blessed end shared only by Elijah in the Bible, and in many ways prefiguring Jesus' own ascension in heaven. Now as we come to chapter 6 of Genesis, we see that Cain's line has come to dominate God's creation. The evil begun by Cain is multiplied until the point at which God is grieved by what he has made and what has become of his creation. There doesn't seem anything to do but unmake it, to wash it clean, to start afresh. But God is not unjust, just as Abraham would plead with God to save Sodom and Gomorrah from destruction, to save just a few righteous people. So God will not destroy all people, regardless of their faithfulness. Noah is a man who walked with God. He had a reconciled relationship with God. And so through the whole world, and so though the whole world is so wicked that it deserves destruction, God will save Noah and preserve a seed of his creation through Noah. Remember, as with Genesis 1 and the creation narrative, we need to concentrate on what part these stories play in the bigger story itself, rather than, say, the scientific reality of whether the whole earth was flooded or not, or whether all the animals could fit on some monstrous boat. What matters most is this. Now the earth was corrupted in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on earth. All flesh had become corrupted, like a plague descending upon all living things. It was the fault of none but the humans God had made. And because God had given them dominion over his creation, their abusive creation had corrupted everything. Because humans had abandoned their relationship with God, their 
dominion over creation was violent, in turn making the creation itself violent. The best way to create an abuser is to abuse him, and so it is with God's creation. Violence breeds violence. The architect who stood back at the new creation, at his creation, looking at the blueprints in his word and the final product and declaring it very good, now gazes at a dilapidated, molded, and graffiti wreck. There is nothing to do but to tear it down. What good is a tree that bears no fruit or bears bad fruit? As Jesus says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. A creation that is not obedient to God, a creation that looks nothing like what he wills in his word of creation, is worthless to God. And God can and does erase it. This is hard for us to believe. And it's okay to be uncomfortable with these stories and not try to dress them up and give the family a friendly version of it. How can God wipe everything out, everything that people value, all gone in 40 short days? Remember how I talked about how most people think the image of God means that we are somehow like God in, in our nature or our being. This means that we think God must be quite a lot like us in, in our best terms, in the best way we can imagine. But God is not like us. And if we try to judge God's actions, we are again doing what Adam and Eve did when they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. We are deciding for ourselves what is good and what is evil, and then judging God by our standards. This means we set ourselves over God, judging Him according to our laws, laws that change quite rapidly throughout history. The psalmist says of those who talk against God, the one who sits in heaven laughs, the, earth, the Lord will mock them. But we should not call what God does here good either. That is also to judge us. It is not something to imitate. There is no justification for, for destroying all things in the name of standing and evil. God needs no justification for his actions because no one can rightfully judge him. But this doesn't mean we can imitate him in this. But the story of Noah is not just about God's judgment. It's also about the way in which God works throughout the great story of the Bible. God chooses one man through whom he will save all of his creation. Instead of destroying all things entirely, God seeks to work through his creation and through his creatures. Noah will be his vessel of salvation, and the ark will convey his creation in seed form to rejuvenation. The waters of destruction will also be the waters that bring new life and a new beginning. In Noah, we see a major theme that repeats throughout the Bible, that of God bringing redemption through a single individual. We will see Abraham, Moses, Joshua, the judges, Samuel, David, the prophets, Jesus, each as a person in whom God is working redemption in the world. But these, except Jesus, of course, are not extraordinary people. They are not the superheroes of the Bible. The Bible doesn't have heroes. They are broken, sinful, and ordinary people, as Noah was himself, as we learn after he gets off the boat. We often think about God as working in astounding ways. Here God is in the flood, destroying everything. This is an event of biblical proportions. But the story isn't about the flood. And it's not just about God working through the one person. It's ultimately, as I've said, the whole Bible is a story about God and who God is and what God is doing in human history. You see, many ancient cultures have stories of terribly destructive floods. And those cultures around the Jewish people had them as well. You know, perhaps we might think there was some catastrophic event that they were all recalling through their mythical traditions. But once again, the book of Genesis is working to subvert the traditional understanding of the flood. It's reinterpreting a common event that of all the cultures share. Instead of it simply being the wrath of God or the gods, Genesis tells us about a man who found favor in the eyes of God.
and became a new beginning. He's not a hero like Gilgamesh, but just an ordinary man who walked with God. The message of Genesis then is loud and clear. God will not endlessly tolerate evil, but rather than total destruction, rather than unmitigated wrath, God is at work for humble people to bring salvation and reconciliation to all things. So when Noah gets off the boat, God makes a covenant with him. A covenant we'll see again and again in the Old Testament. It's like a contract. And God makes these contracts with people throughout the Bible. Like any contract, they say what each party would do and what benefits or drawbacks will accompany the keeping of the covenant or the breaking of it. God makes a covenant here with Noah and with his whole creation. And he will not again destroy it by flooding. And this covenant is shown by the rainbow. Every time the sun shines through the rain, we see that the forces of destructive chaos will not overwhelm us again. God will not start over through the flood. God acknowledges in Genesis 9 that people now have a terrible domination over his creation. Other animals now fear humans. People do not rule by right, but by terror. And God now acknowledges human vengeance and retribution and requires that murder be brought to justice in the way that such ancient peoples would have exercised it. You see, God uses systems of human justice to limit the, the destructive effects of the corrupted relationships that now exist between people and our God. But this does not mean that God is thereby giving his divine approval to these systems. Remember, law exists because we are in a broken relationship with God. Law is not good in and of itself. It's a lesser of two evils. Here, God requires life for life, capital punishment, and later he will require an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But these aren't inventions of God. These aren't inventions even of the Old Testament. They are well attested in ancient law codes that predate all our biblical sources. These are not the ideal way God wants society to be run, but they are ways through which he will work to accomplish his design of reconciliation. Noah and his ark are the first main symbol of how God is at work then through human history. Instead of God angrily smiting everyone who disobeys him, and instead of saying, whatever, to human rebellion, God works through human systems that only reveal how estranged from God we really are. Instead of supporting what humans call good, God craftily works through these systems, subverting them by His love. And this is what so many people have missed in the Bible. We usually look to the Bible to give us good principles to live by, to give us enough to make it through the day, believing that all the chaos and disorder we see in the world is a grand battle between God and the evil powers that God will surely win. We like to find a God who is just like us in the Bible. And there is ample material to find just such a God, because God is working through such a variety of human systems in the Bible. But we mistakenly believe that just because God is working through these systems, that He supports them or blesses them, and that those who support these systems are blessed by God. This is a grand myth of power that violent people use to subjugate others by appealing to heaven to justify their oppression. Instead, what we have is Noah's Ark. The big boat was a symbol for the early and medieval church, for the church itself. Some art portrays a cathedral floating on the waves, as though the ark were a church building itself. The ark is a vessel of salvation in a world bent on evil. It is a refuge from the judgment of God. It is the storehouse of a new creation. All of these things are true of the church. Rather than being piloted by Noah, the church is captained by Jesus. Jesus is the one who walks upon the water, who can reach out to those drowning in a world of sin and place them safe and secure in his boat. We have here a God who works to reconcile people to himself by operating in the midst of a sinful world. He steps out into the depths of our depravity to draw us out and place us in the boat of his reconciliation. And this is what we do as well as the church. Instead of resting content in the boat, 
keeping free from the taints of the world's corrupt systems. We must wade through the monkey and mire, dive into the depths, and love those who are drowning in the ways of the world. We're not here to escape the earth, and we're not here to leave it too long, nor are we here to believe in some notion of a common good that has no reference to the person of Jesus Christ. Nor are we here to try to make others conform to our notion of what goodness is in the name of Jesus. We are, and the United Presbyterian Church of Canyon City is, Noah's Ark for today. Noah and the Ark, God will not tolerate human rebellion and the destruction of his creation forever. But he also works through us and through our ways of life, subverting them by his love so that we come to reconciliation with him. Let us give thanks to our God who works in such a surprising way, treating us with love, justice, and respect. What a great God we serve.